Now we have on the phone, uh, Victor, are you there, Victor Tay? I am. How you doing, Andrew? Excellent. Um, uh, it's, I'm glad to have you on here, Victor. And um, Thank you. I, uh, you, you're the candidate for the Wirra uh, Liberal Democrat Party, Australia Party. Is That's that correct? I've got that correct. Democrats. Yep. And and you are also a pastor, and um, and not 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 as the food, but as a church <laughs> church member, and <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, there I I just I just sort of. When I heard about you and read a bit about you, I thought, oh, I'd really love to have this guy come on the program because uh, I, I just liked what uh, what you stood for and I just wanted to, you to share a bit of your story as well and, and basically also talk about the voting system as well, uh, specifically because that's coming up. But uh, can you really? please... Yeah, can, can you please tell the, the listeners... Uh, uh, to um, let them know where you were born and where you uh, came from. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Well, my parents were Chinese Malaysian immigrants, but I was actually uh, born in Australia. So I was born in Perth and, and grew up in Perth as a as an Australian, basically, an Australian school. Um, I, I moved to Sydney uh, about you know eleven, twelve years ago. So I lived in in Sydney for the last, I believe, eleven years now. Yes, uh, with my family. Uh, I, I married a Mexican lady, so it's interesting because I uh, obviously look Chinese, but I sound Australian. I'm, I'm married to a, a Mexican lady, so uh, my children have like that sort of Chinese Latino mix, so they look quite like, like Filipino children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm a father of uh, six. So I have six children. My youngest is um, just a year and a half, and my oldest is uh, ten and a half. Wow. And, uh, we, we, we're, not, we're not stopping yet because that's usually what when people ask me when they hear I have six children. They ask me, uh, is that it? And I say, hey, you know, I, I don't put a limit on it, but there's none in the oven yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you've certainly been busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but my wife, uh, she's, she's an absolute superstar. So oh, excellent. She keeps, she keeps the house in order, takes care of me at the same time. <laughs> I, I, saw the picture uh, of your, I saw the picture of your children. They look absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah, they definitely don't get it from me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... um yes, yeah, so I've... I've uh, and I've uh, pastored a church for the last seven years. So it's called the Church in Liverpool. It's over towards the Liverpool area in Moorbank. Um, and I've pastored that for the last uh, seven years. And, um, yeah, so and then now I've decided to, to run in Werriwa. So we're, the, the electorate of Werriwa uh, stretches from... In the, in the south, it goes from Macquarie Fields up to Cecil Hills in the north. Yep. And then on the east, it stretches from Kasula to um, sort of the Austral, Badgeries Creek, you know, acreage area over to the left. Right. So um, now I'm the uh, Liberal Democrats candidate for Werriwa as well. Well, okay. Um, so, excellent. So can you tell um, us and the listeners your process on how you decided to become a politician as a minister of your own church and, and why you decided to do that? Sure, no problem. Yeah. You know, it goes back two years ago, really, when um, uh, you know the government was responding to this uh, this COVID pandemic, and I really felt like it was a, an overreaction to to uh, uh, an overreaction to COVID. And the party feels the same way that the, the government has really overreacted to um, this this COVID virus. And and what really pushed me over the edge was um, when the government stop churches from being able to meet. And I thought, you know, freedom of religion in Australia was something that was quite sacred. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people shouldn't be allowed to, you know, the, the government shouldn't be able to stop people from, you know, going to church, worshipping God. And as a Christian pastor, obviously, that was something that, um, you know, made me very upset. Mm -hmm. So in, that was back in 2020. Um, and I went out and protested, uh, you know, these lockdowns. And I was arrested uh, going out and um, protesting against them. So not only were, was our freedom of religion removed, but also even our freedom of speech and our freedom of assembly to be able to protest what was going on. Mm. And I think that's what a lot of people realised with the government's reaction to COVID is that you couldn't even... Um, how, how could you express opposition to what was going on? Because online you were getting censored. You know, the government was basically also shutting down any dissenting voices in the media. And then when you go out and protest, you weren't allowed to, right? Because they effectively outlawed protesting. So it was about that time where I thought, 
you know, I want to get more involved in politics because even though we may ignore politics, unfortunately, politics doesn't ignore us. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I just wanted to get just involved just as a supporter and just, you know, but then 2021 came around and then the lockdowns happened again. Um, and that's why I thought, you know what, if I don't um, stand up and do something about this and get involved, um, then, you know, the country's going to keep going down this tyrannical route. Mm. And, um, you know, that's that's really why I'm running, right? Like, I'm, I'm running because I want to stop the loss of freedoms in Australia. I want my children, mm. to, my children to grow up with the same freedoms that we did. And unfortunately, there's, there's, there's a need for principled people in politics who sort of respect our freedoms and will fight to protect our rights. So I wanted to make sure in Werriwa that there was a candidate that people could vote for that stood for freedom and stood for freedom of choice and freedom of religion and, you know, the freedom that we, we held dear in Australia that seemed to be just getting pulled <laughs> out from beneath us every year. Mm. Uh, so that's why I decided, you know, even though I pastor a church and, you know, serving the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing to me, I just felt like there was a big sort of threat to our freedoms going on right now. And if we don't have people standing up, then when, uh, you know, when you go to the ballot box to actually uh, vote for somebody, you know, you only get a choice on the ballot because people put their hand up to be a candidate. So I just wanted to make sure that there was a candidate in Werriwa that stood for freedom. Uh -huh. That's why I decided to, uh, to run. Yeah, well, 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 good on you. I mean, it's not every day that you just sort of feel like you're doing your, a, a job and then suddenly you want to do another job on top of it, <laughs> at, at, let alone uh, to sacrifice, you know, what you have to do for other people, you know. Um, so, well, you know, well done. And, and Victor, yeah, I don't expect it's going to be easy. I mean, this is my first uh, stint into it. But yeah. we'll see how we go. And hopefully, you know, enough people, uh, you know, are sick and tired of, uh, of what's going on and they agree as well that the government's you know, overreacted and, you know, I hope people realise now that they, what they should be more worried about is not a virus, but the fact that their freedoms are disappearing. Right. Um, well, yeah. sorry, Paul, we had a question for you. Uh, uh, I was just sure. going to say to you, 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 you're with the Liberal Democrat Party, I think, is a lot of us probably That's haven't correct. heard a lot of us probably haven't heard of that party, but maybe you could tell us a bit about the, what the party stands for and why you chose that way instead of going independent, maybe? Yeah, no problem. Um, well, I'll, maybe I'll answer the question first of uh, why go with a party as opposed to independent. And it really just comes down to the support that you're given, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, you, if you're running as an independent, then you're on your own. Okay, yeah. You know, you've got to create all the marketing, all the support material, all the administration, all that. Now, you know, when you're running with a party, I guess you've got to decide, is there a party that you align with close enough that you're willing to carry their banner? So some people, they, they don't find a party that they agree with enough, so they run independent and then they have their own challenges, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. of running independent. Um, there's also just the name recognition as well. So if, if the party is large enough and there's some name recognition, then you get some support from that. But a bit about the Liberal Democrats. So the, the Liberal Democrats, um, they're not the Liberal Party. I'll say that <laughs> first and foremost. Yep. Okay. Because most people, when they hear the Liberal Democrats, they think, are you the Liberal Party? No, no they're not. They just... Uh, happen to have the same name in them. Um, now, the American political system has sort of painted those words as well, because when you hear what liberal in America and Democrat in America, you kind of think, are they the left wing sort of, uh, you know, uh, crazies in, in, in America? But in, in, a, in Australia, uh, the liberal Democrat, so the terms themselves, if you take away, you know, the American political taint on them, if you're, if you're a liberal, it means you believe in liberty. And if you're a Democrat, you believe in democracy. So the Liberal Democrats uh, is a party that stands for liberty and democracy. Okay. But in terms of the philosophy, what they stand for, um, my, my campaign message is less government, more freedom. So there are parties that stands for small government, you know, low taxes, personal freedom. So they believe that you know, the role of government should be you know, very minimal in scope just, you know, consistent to preserve a civilised society. So another way to say that is, you know, government is there to pr protect your rights. They're not there to tell you how to live your life. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, big government is generally very wasteful and authoritarian, you know. It's, uh, they, um, and, and we find that go government is generally the, the biggest threat to our freedom, uh, you know, not a virus. 
And, so, you know, they believe that, you know, you spend your own money, you know, more effectively than politicians and bureaucrats do. So, you know, that's why it's, it's better rather than people looking to government for solutions. Government is normally the problem. So it's better that less power is given to government and, you know, people keep more of their own money and they have more power to make the choices with their own money. Mm. Um, and that's what the party is about, you know, less government, uh, more freedom. So we have a, a freedom manifesto that the, the party has drafted and that basically outlines, you know, the 10 policies that, you know, really sort of push this philosophy of less government, more freedom. Mm. And if people want to read more about that, they can go to my website, victortay.com.au, that's Tay, T-E-Y, victortay.com.au, and they can read those uh, 10 policies. And we can talk about some of these uh, 10 policies as well. Well, okay. And I, I just got to, uh, I just wanted to ask you what, um, as a Liberal Democrat uh, party, mm-hmm. How would they have handled the, the COVID system when it came in? Like, how would they have done it? Yeah, well, the solution to COVID is, is very, very simple, right? Because people, they, they know how people can make choices to take care of, you know, you know to manage their own risk. So, you know, if, if we simply, you know, protected the vulnerable and the elderly, you know, so, you know, obviously, you know, people who are vulnerable to COVID... They, they obviously can have the choice to stay at home and isolate and, you know, the elderly, if they're worried about catching it, they may not want to see as many people, you know, if, if it's out the community. But for people who are not, to, you know, not, you know, at risk of death of COVID, you know, like, for example, you know, people who are in their 20s to 50s, the chances of dying of COVID was, stati- was st- statistically zero, mm. right? For children, it was zero. Yeah. So, so why are we closing schools? Why are we stopping children from going to school? Why are we stopping, you know, fathers and people going to work to provide for their family? Like people can can decide for themselves whether they're willing to take that risk and can go to work. And so, we we don't need a, a government overreaching response that just locks everyone in their home and just removes everyone's freedom. Because what was the cost of that? I mean, we were told every day you know, what the COVID numbers were, but we weren't told how many people were, you know, committing suicide, mm. how many businesses were going out of business, how many people were losing their jobs, how many people couldn't afford their rent anymore. You know, the, 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 the damage that's been done over the last two years is, is absolutely catastrophic and it's not, we're not going to recover from it mm. just, you know, in a couple of months. No. We're going to be feeling the effects of this. I mean, we're feeling the effects of it now, right? Where people are out of the job and there's shortages it's and spent all their savings. Australia. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. the, the solution was, you know, you, you quarantine the elderly and the vulnerable, right? You you allow them to make that choice, right? And then the rest of us get on with our lives. Right, and and if you if you're not if you're not feeling well, you go you go get checked out at the doc. You get a test done, you and uh, you 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 know you, you do something about it, like you do every year when you get the flu or virus or something. Exactly, I think Australians are you know they're smart enough to to take care of themselves, and but the problem is we have a government that, that you know you know like, have you ever heard of the phrase the nanny state? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I I did I actually did this past week. I I, I heard we we we've become a nanny society is what I heard from someone. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, like we were already a nanny state. Yeah. It's just it, people real like more people realised it when they saw how the government was handling COVID. But, and, and think about this as well. Let's say you were an older person, but you were willing to take the risk because you wanted to see your grandchildren. You wanted to spend time with your family at Christmas. I mean, are you not allowed to, to make that choice? Whereas the government wasn't even allowing people to make that choice. But that's, that's, the, that's the symptom of a tyrannical government, right? Like if we have a tyrannical government with authoritarian politicians. I, I this have is to, how they handle COVID, right? Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. A libertarian-minded government would allow people to make their own choices of that risk. You know? Yes, exactly. Um so, so Victor, I just yeah. want to let you know. Um, yeah. See, with, with uh, Indigenous people, mm-hmm. they have felt this tyrannical, um, whatever you, you, you control from the government for hundreds of years. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so, 
non-Indigenous people got a taste of it through COVID. Yeah, yeah. You see the I heard about what happened in the Northern Territory where they were forced vaccinating people and shipping them off to quarantine camps. Is that the sort of stuff that you're referring to, that they, they seem to come down harsher on uh, Aboriginal people than, than other well, well, you, communities? Yeah, no, we're talking about um, Aboriginal people have had to fight for their rights for the past few hundred years. To even up until mm-hmm. present time, they're still fighting, fighting for their rights. They haven't had the... We only started... Aboriginal people have started voting. It would have been counted as people in 1967. Ah, right. They weren't counted as people. They weren't allowed to vote before then. So they have been coming up the line, fighting every step of the way for their rights, where with COVID that happened in the last two years, non-Indigenous people here in Australia got a taste of what that was really like. They didn't didn't get a taste of it because (laughs) they didn't have their rights. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so there's already an inherent distaste of yes. Aboriginal people for, you know, authoritarian governments. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely, yeah, it's, it's completely the opposite in Asian culture. They, they trust government way too much. Mm. And, um, hey, you know, well, that's why, you know, maybe there's a silver lining uh, through this, uh, this sort of COVID response is that people are starting to realise that, you know, liberty is important. Yeah, well, well, maybe, you know, because we've been voting for either Labor or Liberal, have either been in for how many years now, and and it's like, uh, I don't know if we want to vote for either party now. We want other people to step up. In <laughs> um, Yeah, well, there's definitely definitely other choices. You know, the Liberal Democrats is one of them. Excellent, <laughs> yes. Uh, Victor, yeah. I was going to say, you, you've had some high-profile candidates or, or members members for WERA over the years, hey, so... Um, it, 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 I'm sure that doesn't daunt you at all, but uh, there's been some pretty high-profile um, members of that electorate of yours out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there is. It's been a, it's been well, a labor well, team for a long time, and I think there's been some high-profile labor people. But see, that's the thing as well, though, that a lot of the the old labor voters and old labor members, I mean, the labor party that they once supported, you know, back in those days, is very different. I mean, look at where. I mean, Mark Latham was the MP for Werra at one point, and he's not with Labor anymore, is he? <laughs> no, no, he's with he's with One Nation, and then of course Gough, yeah. Gough Whitlam was the the member of Werra for a long time, also. But but I think you are right. I think people are looking for changes. People are looking for alternative uh, members, and maybe you're that. Maybe that's you. Maybe the people, if you get the word out there, possibly that's what they're looking for—a bit of a breath of fresh air. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely time for a change. I mean, the people that have been voting Labor and Liberal their whole life, hopefully they, they realise now that, uh, you know, they, they don't they don't care about your freedoms. They're not, they're not the parties of what they once were, you know. Mm. Oh, well, um, okay. Um, I just want yeah. to find out um, from you, Victor. Um, so what, what do the uh, – we're going to move on to the next subject, which is what do the listeners sure. have to know about voting and how can they make their voice – count or their vote count? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, mm-hmm. where, where, should I, I guess, where should I start? So, we'll start um, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah and, and we'll talk about this a bit because I think this is a very important topic. Yes. Right? Because I think a lot of Australians don't really understand our, our voting system and, um, you know, they, they think they only have the two options. Like you guys talked about, they think there's only Liberal and there's only Labor. And if they don't like Liberal, then they vote Labor and vice versa. But they, there are a slew of other parties, right? The Liberal Democrats is one of them. And I'm sure there are other parties out there as well. I'm sure you can think of a few that, you know, don't like what's going on. They're for liberty. So you want to find a party that you, you know, agree with. Hopefully, you know, I've convinced you that it's the Liberal Democrats. Let's say you have a listener and and they think, you know, they look at Liberal and Labor and like me, they don't see a difference, right? The same big government, take all your money and waste it all and take away all your freedoms. So they want to vote for another, they want to vote for another party. Now, some of the misconceptions that are out there and and generally they are promulgated by the, the, the two parties that are in power because they want you to think this way. They will tell you that if you vote for a party other than Liberal or Labor, that you are wasting your vote, right? Mm. Now, that is not true in Australia. 
right? In Australia, we have a system called preferential voting, right? Preferential voting, you'll notice that when you go and you fill out your ballot on election day, mm. you're actually numbering boxes, yeah. right? It's not like in America. Like in America, they have what's called a first-past-the-post system. What that means is if you have five options on your ballot, you choose one and then you put your ballot in. Now, in that system, right, it is very difficult for a third option to rise to the top. Why? Because let's say if you're voting red and I'm voting blue and then party green comes along, right, or whatever other color, party yeah. green comes along. Now, why, if, if I vote, vote, normally vote for red, why would I want to vote for green? Because I would only reduce the, the, the vote count for red. Because in a first-past-the-post system, it's whoever gets the highest number. They're yeah. the winner. Yeah. Now, in Australia, that's not the case because, you know, I guess whoever created the Australian system had enough sense to go, hey, that is not a good democratic system. Mm. A good democratic system is that if, if we put our vote in and then the last person doesn't win, then those votes should get redistributed to those voters' next person. And if the, the last person doesn't win again, then those votes get distributed to the next person's preference. So, so what you're actually doing on the ballot is you're not just deciding who you're giving your number one to. You also have to decide who's going to be your number two, who's going to be your number three. Because you're saying, if, if this person doesn't get in, I want this person. And if this party doesn't get in, then I want this party. And so on and so forth down the line. Mm. Now, what that means is that the vote doesn't split because if you're preferred party doesn't get in, then it just goes full value to the next party. If they don't go in, it goes to the next party. Right? So there is no there is this there is no um, splitting the vote in Australia. You know, everyone gets to say on how their how their vote is allocated. Does that make so, sense? So, well, uh, hang on. Um, so if you vote um, Say uh, you you got the red, the blue, and you got uh, the green, or it could be orange or purple, whatever that other colour is. Um, yeah. So uh, if I if I went in and I voted for that colour instead of the red or the blue, um, are you saying? Uh, hang on, that would that would that would stay within that area? It wouldn't go over to the other red or the blue? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, if, so let's say if if you so let's say you wanted, you know, let's say you got Liberal Democrats at the top. Let's just use three parties for example. You got Liberal Democrats, Labor, and Liberal. Yeah. Right. So let's say you go. I I really like, you know, the Liberal Democrats' policies. I think Victor's a principal person. I'm going to give him my first vote. Yeah. Now, if if Victor doesn't get in, right? Now I'm I'm going to be then, you know, taken out of the the two that are left. Right. Yeah. But you still want to say in between, say, Liberal and Labor. Yeah. Right? So then you may go, okay, well, I'll go Liberal number two, Labor number three. Right? But what the major parties want you to think is that if you put Liberal Democrats as number one, it's a wasted vote. But it's not because... Ah, uh, I see what now, you mean. You've, yeah. told them, you've told the major parties, I don't want you as number one. I want Liberal Democrats as number one. But even if they don't win, I've still given them my number one. I still get a say in who's left. Yeah, yeah that's the, the, good. Pe the penny dropped for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where some people think I have to choose one party. No, you are you are ranking in preference the parties that you prefer. So what you want to do this election, if you don't like the major parties and what they've been doing, is you you fight out all the minor parties that you like. You go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all those minor parties, and then you put your major parties last. <laughs> okay, they so could be number so nine you, or ten. <laughs> yeah, so that means you give all the minor parties that you like the opportunity to get your vote. Uh, to, right? to rise up to the occasion, yes, yes. That's okay. right. And only if they don't get in, you still have a say in the more moment. Now, in the, in the lower house, so the lower house is that little green ballot. Yes. Right? And then the upper house is that big white ballot, right? Yeah. Now, in, in the green on the green ballot, the lower house ballot, you have to number every box for your vote to count. Yes. So you can't just put one Liberal Democrat and then put it in the box because when they count that vote, they'll go, ah, it's not filled out correctly. They just discard it. Oh, all those votes get wasted. Well, then they get wasted if you don't fill them out. Yeah. So they're they're called like informal ones. Yeah. Um, that's a different name. So a, 
you know, formal vote is somebody that, you know, they might just, you know, the only, the only way your vote doesn't count is if you don't fill it out properly, right? If you don't fill it out at all. So yeah. you, some people, they go get their name kicked off and then they throw their ballot in empty, which is a real waste, right? Yeah. Some people maybe don't fill it out properly. You know, they don't fill out all the boxes on the green ballot. It doesn't get counted either. Mm. Some people, they do what's called a donkey vote. But they just go one, two, three, four, five from the bottom, top to the bottom. Right. So there's, there's a certain percentage. If, you, if you're lucky enough to get the top spot on the ballot, there's a certain percentage that you get just because a bunch of people will donkey vote. Right. Oh, right. One, <laughs> one to the end. <laughs> but if you want your vote to actually make a difference, you want to know who's on your ballot, and you, 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 you here's what you got to remember. You are, you are numbering them in the preference that you want them to win. You're not numbering them in the... In the in the order you think they're likely to win. Right, yes. So you might go, you might go. oh, you know, I'm in the Labor area. It's more likely that Labor's going to win, so I'm going to vote Labor. That's, that's silly, right? Yeah. You just vote in preference order. That's right. why we have preferential voting. Now, in the, in the, in the upper house, it's, it's different mm. because that represents the whole state, right? So that's why that ballot paper is like a mile long. Right. So they don't expect the voter to fill out every box. So you have to fill out at least six, right? You fill out as many as you can. No, yeah, are you, you, are you yeah. supposed to fill them all out, or they just they just think we're not we're not going to fill them all out? Or? No, you can, but it's not c- compulsory to fill them all out. Right. Right, but then when they when they count the 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 large ballot. So let's say, you know, you've numbered one, two, three, four, five, they'll go to number one. If number one doesn't win, it'll go to your number two. If number two doesn't win, it goes to number three. But then let's say number three doesn't win, and then you haven't put a number four on your white ballot. Then it gets what's called exhausted. Exhausted means that now they, they can't allocate it to anyone anymore. Right, yeah. You, have, you haven't specified it on your ballot. Yeah. So a smart way, I think, to, to vote... Uh, on the big white ballot, you know, you put one Liberal Democrat, <laughs> and you put minor party B that you like, and then minor party C, minor party D, three, four, and then you end on your preferred major party, right? Because uh, in, in all likelihood, they're probably going to be the last two standing in most in most seats. Yeah. So that that means that you, on your ballot, you voice who you preferred, you know, above the major parties. But then you still get a say in which major party you preferred. Right. So, um, uh, yeah, I get that. So, having gone through that process, uh, say, say if you know people did vote you uh, vote Liberal Democrats and that, and uh, and then uh, say Liberal wins again, what happens mm-hmm. with your party? What happens to our party? Yes. Well, one one thing that's important about who you give your number one to, I don't know if you know this, but the, the AEC actually provides funding back to the party you know, to offset some of their expenses. So one way you can actually d- directly help a party is if you give them your number one vote, you actually get some funding, and then they can use that to, to run their next campaign. Right. So if, they, if, they don't, if you don't win a campaign, the party doesn't disappear. Obviously, they're going to try again with the next campaign. You know, there's state elections, right. there's local elections. And things like that. Yeah. So, but, you know, whoever you give your number one to, you're not only directly voices, that's the number one that you prefer, but you also help them with a bit of funding as well. Right, okay. That makes sense then. I get it. Well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, very important that, you know, people understand preferential voting. Um, another, another misconception probably it's good to talk about as well is yeah. people always ask, you know, wh- where do your preferences go? I always ask that question. They'll say, like, oh, if I vote for you, where do your preferences go? Yeah. But the reason why people ask that question is because in, in 2013 and prior, on that big white ballot that I was telling you about, yeah. see, right now, the way you vote with the big white ballot, you either number above the line, which is all the parties, or you can number below the line, which a lot of people don't because it's just a lot of numbers underneath, right? Yeah. A lot of it. But if you want the most control over your vote, you can number boxes underneath underneath the line. Right. Um, now, in 2013 and prior, you used to be able to just put just a one above the line. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is where people get confused because back then, 2013 and before, all you had to do to fill out the white ballot is just put a one above the line on the party you liked and then you submitted your ballot and that was it. Yeah. So the way it worked back then is you were basically allocating your vote to that party and if they didn't win, then they could decide who your vote went to based on a preference list that they had figured out prior to the election, right? Yes, yes. So the yes. Liberal Democrats, they might have done some, some deals or Liberal or Labor. Everyone's doing some, some deals, right, to say, okay, if we pull out preference ones, it'll flow in this order to these different parties. And mm. I, I don't think back then it was like public information, right? The, the way a party allocated um, the votes that were given to them on that big white ballot. Right. The green ballot has always been the same. You always have to number every box. Yeah. Right? The white ballot, you could put a one and then it, it would give it to the party to allocate. Now, in 2016, that system was abolished. Right? So mm-hmm. they, the, the, they, they changed the electoral system where now you as the voter have to specify who you want to allocate your vote to. Right, yeah. Right? This is why it changed from putting a one above the line to at least numbering six. So you can number less, but the reason why they say number at least six is because they 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 want your vote to have less chance of exhausting before it gets allocated to somebody. Right. I'm saying it's it's good to end it on a major party, so you have a say in, in one of the two, in the Liberal Labor, the two that are left. Right. Okay. So, so this is where people always ask this question, like, well, where are your preferences going? And the truth is. Parties don't allocate preferences anymore. Now only the voters allocate preferences. Yeah. Yep. So preference deals amongst parties now are, are about what do they put on their how to vote card. So on their how to vote card, they'll make recommendations to voters. Hey, this is how we think you should vote. But the voter can can follow that recommendation or not. So right. He has a choice. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But there, there still is some sway there in the sense that, you know, a lot of voters will just follow their party's... Um, yeah. 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 Follow the, the family uh, trait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you well, say that. Well, okay, so how yeah, yeah. do people contact you if they want to, like, communicate to you or send you a message or ask you questions or...? Yeah, they, they can find me at victortay.com.au. So all my social media links are there. They can um, contact me there. Um, so they're just going to spell victortay.com.au. Yep. Um, they can find me there, definitely. Excellent. And and I know you're very fast at answering your communications because I experienced it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You know, uh, you know uh, Victor, one thing I experienced recently is uh, there was some petition uh, about... Uh, something to do with saving the koalas in a particular part of the land. And I filled out this petition and I sent it and it, it went to all these different politicians. And you know what? And only one politician really gave me a complete answer to the question and all the others gave me a generic answer email to that actual um, petition. So I, I really like to, you know, I, I thought that was quite uh, telling when I when I when I did that recently. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah anyway. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and so uh, one last question I'd like to ask my guests before they go off, uh, Victor, is what does human rights mean to you? Sure, sure. Well, I think to me, you know, human rights, I, I don't believe rights come from the government. You know, rights come from God. And I think, uh, you know, God puts, God puts governments on earth, <laughs> You know, in a sense, he puts that authority on earth um, to protect those rights. So, you know, human rights to me are, you know, things that are, you know, should be protected by the government. So, you know, a right to our body, a right to our life, you know, a right to work, a right to, to move about freely, a right to decide, you know, what goes into our body. So, you know, I think uh, different people maybe, you know, there's probably debate over, you know, what is a human right and what isn't. But, um, you know, I would say human rights are things that are given to us by God that government should protect. Um, and, and that's really what uh, what freedom is about. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much um, for coming on the program, Victor. I really, really appreciate it. Right, great. Thanks for having me.
Well, okay. All the best, Victor, and good luck with your campaign. Yeah, very. Yeah, good we, luck. <laughs> we wish you well. Thank you very much, guys. We do. All the best. Bye now. Okay, thank you, Victor. Visit victortay.com.au to learn more and download our Freedom Manifesto, which outlines our 10 policies for the coming federal election. Authorised by John Humphreys for the Liberal Democrats, Mount Waverley, Victoria.